perhaps not very clear, what I'll be talking about for the next hour is a C++ library, pretty low level. So if any of you are expecting to hear JavaScript type things, um, you won't. So you might want to uh, readjust priorities based on that. Also, if you want to play along there at home, code.google.com slash p slash libkml. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, the presentation that I'll be giving right now is linked right here so you can follow along and skip ahead. Okay, this is what I'll be doing. I want to go through a quick whistle-stop tour of KML, uh, then talk about libkml, which is our C++ library. I'll delve into the architecture, talk a little bit about motivations, um, design goals, why we're doing what we're doing, then how we're doing it, show some example programs, and then talk a little bit about where we want to go in the future. So KML is all of these things you see here. Most importantly, for the past year, we've been working with the Open Geospatial Consortium, the OGC, to bring KML into the status of being a full open international standard. And what that means is, for a long time, people wanted to use it because it was a de facto standard, but they couldn't because some people quite recently had restrictions on not using things that are not open standards. It is now. Um, that's the standard number. A few of us here are very proud of that. It's widely used. Um, if you were in Michael Jones' session, you heard him talk about the collaboration between Google and ESRI. ESRI is the, is the world leader in GIS, Geographic Information Systems. They will be publishing, or they will enable people to publish all of their data in KML. And there's an awful lot of, of geospatial data that's it's out there, and it's, it's locked up. It's, it's part of what we sometimes call the dark web. We're going to get access to that. Uh, Microsoft and Yahoo have both been announcing KML support in various places and various of their products over the past year. And we're only going to see more of that. And right now, on the web, the GeoWeb that we index, we have tens of millions, just for emphasis, tens <laughs> of millions of files. So. What is KML? This is KML. It's an XML-based markup language. I, I hope you're all familiar with this. Uh, that's our hello world, or hello earth. It's a place mark with name and a point on the earth. That's what it looks like in uh, Google Maps. You see on the left, we have the list view entry with the feature's name. It has a default icon. It also has a default visibility, which is on, and so on. We can do more. KML allows you to style not only geometry, but also the feature itself and how that's displayed in the client. And so here you see we have something called a balloon style, something called an icon style. A balloon style gives you more control over what appears in the pop-up window when you click on an icon. And an icon style allows you to style the icon. That's what it looks like in Microsoft Virtual Earth. You can see that. The icon style is the logo for this event. And in the description balloon, we no longer have the traditional to and from links, and it's been bolded and so on. And as we travel through the spectrum of complexity of KML, we, we begin to leave the place where you're happy typing a notepad, and we move into much more complicated things. Here you see two of, two of my favorite elements, network link and region. Network link is essentially a pointer to more stuff. It allows you to fetch conditionally. And a region, uh, a region allows you to trigger the visibility of a feature based on a level of detail, based on your, your zoom level, in effect. And when you combine those things, you get something very powerful. You get a way to stream large amounts of data, millions of features, um, to a client. And the way we do that in Google Earth, we do it a lot now. All of our layers, not all of our layers, most of our layers, are moving towards streamed KML. And this is essentially how we do it. We publish a top-level network link that has a region. And when that region is triggered, it becomes active, it fetches more network links and some data that you see. And as you move through 
this data, more network links become triggered, more regions become active, and so on. And, and the client is never overwhelmed with too much data. You're only ever looking at, at what you can reasonably show. And that's, that's how that often appears. That's the Bay Area with a bunch of YouTube and Google News and National Geographic and so on. And so as we, as, as this more and more becomes the world of how you publish KML and how you interact with KML, we, we need, a, we need a, a better tool to do this. Um, can you raise your hand if you've ever written any helper routines to parse or generate KML? Okay, keep your hand up if you've done that more than once. Precisely. You're sick of it, and we are too, so we're going to try to solve it. And libkml is, is part of the solution of how we're going to do that. So in addition to that, there are some other motivations for us to, to do this. And it mostly has to do with KML becoming a standard. Um, I sit not very far away from several of the OpenGL luminaries, and we, we take a lot of pointers from them. If today you want to run off and write your own OpenGL renderer, you can, and there's a very well-defined standard for it, but once you've done that, how do you know you've got it right? It has a reference implementation. You can, you can compare your pixels to their pixels, and you'll know if you got it right. We want to do something similar for KML. There is a pretty well-defined language specification, but the, uh, the second point points towards a slightly more thorny problem. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff about KML that is essentially implementation specific. However, it's not reasonable to have an implementation just decide to make up whatever random rules it would like to. For example, in region, uh, we have this concept of min LOD pixels, max LOD pixels that decides based on the projected pixel size of a region on the ground, when does that feature become active? That's, that doesn't fit in very well to a language specification. It has to be part of an implementation specification. And again, we can't have many implementations deciding randomly what to do. And so this is also part of our effort to, to help standardize some of, some of that behavior. And there's also the question of what happens with KML going forward? Um, it's, it's relatively new uh, to some people, and there's a lot more that everyone, including us, would like to do with it. And how do we do that? And the answer has got to do with why KML has been so successful. Much of that has come from the development practices we've followed, which is pretty much build it first, and then spec it and define it a little later. We don't start with the XML and implement from that. We start with writing code in the client, in our products, and then we standardize from that. We reflect that out to XML. So that way, KML has stayed, for the most part, very lean and mean. We want to encourage that. We want to help keep it that way. And you're not Google Earth developers or Google Maps developers, not on the core thing, so you can't have access to the core engine. And so building this, our open source library is our way of helping everybody stay in the same trench as us. If you want to add something to KML, change something about KML, then change it in reference implementation first. Make sure it can be done because things like performance are important. And it also helps everyone understand the structure of the language. So when we started out, we, we sat around the table and we, we dreamt up what we thought we should be doing. And this is a condensed list of that. First and foremost, it has to be a full reference implementation of the entire standard from soup to nuts. Uh, it has to be cross-platform. I'm, I'm a Mac guy. I use Linux at work, and I see at least one person with a Windows machine. So it's not interesting unless it, unless it satisfies all platforms. It also has to be open source. And we've chosen the BSD license, which is very open. It means that those of you who want to use this in your commercial products, you can. You don't need to ask permission. Um, those of you who want to change it, you can do that too. That's also fine. And 
Another design goal is, uh, at, at Google, we're kind of religious about unit testing. There's a very strong belief that if your code isn't tested, it's only working by accident. So you'll see that nearly every CC file here has a, an associated test.cc. We try to test as many code paths as possible. And if you check it out and build it and then type make check, it will, I can probably just do that. goes on for a while. We run a lot of checks and we exercise all code paths to make sure that what we're doing is as close to perfect as we can be. And it's part of development driven um, software engineering. It's really cool. We did recently did some optimization of the parser to speed it up and afterwards we could just type make check ensure all unit tests pass and we knew we were uh, doing the right thing. We don't want this to be developed in a vacuum. And hopefully that's why you're here, because we need your help as well. This has to be driven by real world applications. If it's, if it's not, then it, it risks not being as useful as it could be or should be. And despite the, our aspirations towards being a reference implementation, performance is also important. We recognize that. We want this to be something that you can reasonably use. Link it into your applications and use it as is. A few more things. Um, it's, 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 easy to, it's easy to get things wrong. And so we want to help you know, protect ourselves from ourselves. And it should be impossible to use the API to generate anything that is not super perfect, super strict, schema valid, OGC KML 2.2. Um, we're also big fans of Postal and his uh, robustness principle. So therefore, we are very gracious in what we accept, and very forgiving, but very strict in what we emit. Um, it's often passed over, I think, but it's important to recognize that Google Earth has done something kind of strange from the start, and it's paid off in big ways for us, and we want to make sure everybody else recognizes that. You can right now take a, a KML 2.2 file that has new elements like photo overlay in it. You can take that file, put it into uh, Google Earth 3.0 from two and a half years ago, three years ago. It will ignore gracefully the things it doesn't understand, but when you save it back out, it recognizes everything it didn't understand, and it preserves it in a semantically valid and equivalent manner. That's, that saved our bacon more than once doing that. And so libkml implements exactly the same behavior. So we have lossless round tripping. Anything we don't understand, we bundle it up, save it, store it. And when it comes time to serialize, it happens magically. You don't need to worry about that. It's taken care of. Um, obviously, we need to keep the interface separate from the implementation. There's a couple more things we still have to do to, to really get there, but hopefully if you look at the code, that's apparent. And lastly, we, we recognize that C++ isn't super interesting to everyone. And so we're using the Swig interface generator to, to bind to other languages. Um, our 0.2 release will give you Python and Java as well. So, who uses this thing? Mostly right now, there's a few people playing with it. If you see the mailing list, which is linked from the front page, you can see a couple of other people playing around with it, but mostly we do. As I said, we don't want this to be developed in a vacuum, so therefore we've been using it pretty consistently from the start. And the KML that we publish, we've started using this tool within our, our core Google infrastructure to build checking and parsing mechanisms for everything. So the unit tests that, that sit here are wonderful. The main unit test is those tens of millions of files that I mentioned earlier. And you'll find very, very few memory leaks within libgml because we use our MapReduce infrastructure to massively parallel parse lots and lots of files. So 
if you, if you leak a few bytes in every parse, you're doing a MapReduce, you run out of memory really quickly. And who do we use? If you're going to build this, you need a couple of extra things. We use XPAN as our core XML parser. Um, a difference from the point one release, if any of you were checking that out, we now use Boost. Boost we give to you. Uh, it's, we, we use very little of it. It's only in header files, so therefore we ship it because the licenses are compatible. Um, if you're on Mac or Linux, Mac's, Mac's like a dream. It mostly just works right out of the box. Um, Windows, we were using SCONs. We've decided to go with a more native approach. We heard consistent requests for that, so Visual Studio is, is what we use on Windows. And optionally, if you want to do unit testing, you need CPP unit. And if you want Python, Java, you need Swig. Okay. This is our source code. And if you glance through it, you can see some interesting things. Under source KML, we have core subdirectories, DOM engine, Eugenator, and Util. Uh, I've got a couple of Swig directories, and this gives you a pretty good hint at the architecture that we have. There are four libraries. Two of them are core, DOM and Engine, and Regenerator and Util are, are not core. So KML DOM is the, it's the core DOM module. When we parse a KML file, we parse it into what is essentially a C++ class hierarchy. Um, that's where we have right now the parser and serializer and the element creation factory. When it's generate KML, you generate it from a DOM factory. Engine is something we're working on right now. The DOM is mostly done. Engine is what we've just started on. It has higher level processing. Um, so you can imagine DOM is like the power tool. You can hurt yourself with it. Uh, engine is going to be slightly more refined. Um, Regenerator and Util, I'm not going to talk about too much. Regenerator, keep your eye on that because we want to do some fun things there. So to begin with, we want this to be a one-to-one -one mapping as, as strictly as we can make it from the implementation to the, the core language itself. And so you'll see that this, if you were in Paul's talk, you saw exactly the same diagram. Never mind angle brackets. This is really KML. You can see that the dotted boxes are the, the abstract elements, and the solid ones are, are the concrete elements that you can instantiate and play with. Uh, everything comes from object, and we have features. Those are the entries in the list view, seven of them. It's three overlays, two containers, network link, and place mark. Uh, we have different types of geometry and styling and links. These are the things that are core to KML. If we look at how KML itself is defined in the XSD language, the XML schema description, um, you can see it has it inherits from something called abstract feature type, and it contains an abstract geometry group. It's optional; it doesn't have to be there, and by default, max cards is one, so you only get one of them. If we look at libkml, this is the header file for placemark.h, and we can see that inherits from feature, and that's our geometry. We can get it, we can check if it has it, and we can set it and clear it. Array APIs, we don't expose anything like um, STL containers. Internally, we use an STL vector. From the API perspective, you don't know that. So we implement very, very simple things like feature array size and feature array at as an accessor. And that's how you would walk through a parsed folder to get out of the children. And you would set it in much the same way. So every complex element maps to a C++ class, every element's member of a class. So we have objects and fields. If we recall the, the Hello Earth from the introduction, if we were going to generate this, that's the C code we would use to do it. We'll come back to the factory a little later. We get the factory. We ask it for a place mark, set its name, get coordinates, set the coordinates, point, set the coordinates in the point, and finally set the geometry in the place mark. When you serialize it, you'll get that. Um, the swig bindings, 
If you want to do this in Python, it looks much like that. In fact, precisely like that. And if you flick back and forth, you'll see that it is nearly one-to-one -one exact with C++. So Swig is kind of cool in that way. It's a blessing and a curse. Um, it means that the API is more or less consistent. But then again, it means that you're writing C++ in any language that you swig to. The factory I mentioned, um, in the DOM module, we protect or make private nearly all of the constructors such that you have to get yourself a factory before you can create anything. We, we do this for pretty good reasons. Um, we don't use, by default, RTTI, runtime type information, mostly just to keep things as small and as fast as possible. Um, but we do use inheritance and polymorphism and cool things like that, so we have our own type inspection system. The type and is a. Every element, every concrete element, every abstract element has a type that you can query for. That's what it looks like in the code. If we look at the top half of place mark again, we can see that there is the type. It will return one of these. And you can check for is a, pass in your own type, and see what it is. And so there's a place mark created from the factory, and we can check that it is indeed of type place mark. And if you recall the block diagram, a place mark, it's a place mark, obviously, but it's also a feature, and it's also an object. So you can walk yourself through the inheritance hierarchy like this, and same with point. So what that means is we don't give you dynamic cast by default either. If you're C++ guys, you're probably pretty used to that. So how do we do it? Again, we have our own very lightweight version of the same thing that doesn't cost you RTTI. Um, if you have a, if you have an element, you can try casting it to a place mark. Um, you, you just call as place mark. It'll either return you one of these or null. And this is near enough a complete program using what we've looked at so far. There's a string of KML, it's got KML and it's got a place mark with a name and that's it. So when we call parse on it, we're, we're inside the KML DOM namespace right now. Uh, we parse it into an element putter and we can check that the root is of type KML and it has a feature. And this is how we get the place mark from it. We just call as place mark that feature, and now we know what it is. And again, we can check that it has a name. You'll see that this perhaps doesn't look familiar. We'll come back to what these uh, PTRs are. Um, in the first release we made of this, we were uh, pretty lazy. We just gave you raw pointers, and so you had to you know, if you, if you knew anything, you had to delete everything afterwards. Uh, we promised we'd fix that, and we have for the most part. Um, in fact, it turns out that Boost has fixed it for us. They have very nice smart pointer libraries, and so we chose to use um, something called intrusive pointer. Any of you familiar with scope pointer and things like that? Some are. Um, it's, a, it's, it's like shared pointer. It's a reference counted smart pointer. Um, but it's very, very lightweight, so the size of a pointer is just the size of a raw pointer. These PTRs you see, uh, they are just type defs to an intrusive pointer of that type. And KML DOM itself, our aspiration for that is that it is simply just the raw DOM. Right now there's parse and serialize mixed in there. Um, you'll see that in KML engine, we're we're moving away from that slightly. Um, we'll probably keep a lot of this stuff here in DOM. As I said, it's a par tool, it'll be there. But we want to move towards this, uh, this KML engine concept. In particular, uh, KML file and KMZ file as well. So this is really what we're concentrating on right now. Um, Bent and I, my, my coworker, we've been hacking on this over the past week. We're gonna check some stuff in pretty soon and you'll see more of this come down. I'm going to give you some demos soon. Um, ideally, when you guys use this, this will be the main interface you're using. 
we want to do some, we, we, we want to take the DOM aspect beyond where it is right now. Um, it's an append only DOM right now. So there's no way to walk into an array and start setting things or changing things. Uh, you can't really detach trees just yet. Uh, so these are the things we'll be working on for our 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 version. And kernel engine is also what's going to give you um, KMZ access. KMZ is a compressed KML. So essentially it's just a, it's a, it's a zip archive. But it's special in some respects because it can contain uh, resources like images and models and so on that things in the KML file inside the archive can refer to. Uh, it's kind of a pain dealing with that. So we want to make your lives easier in that respect also. Give you a clean API to doing all of these things. Okay. So if you look in the examples directory, you will see See a bunch of hello worlds. Let me drop this down. Show you some code. This is this is parse KML. You can see that we have one header for the DOM. That's all you need to include for engine. We're not quite there yet. We'll we'll fix that pretty soon. And this is how we this is how we parse things. We're going to parse it into an element putter, which is the base class that everything else inherits from. And we're just going to parse the string. We're going to convert it to a place mark because we already know what it is. And then we're going to print the name. And so if I run that, that's what it does. This is an example of how we create KML. See, we've got some using declarations here to keep things smaller. This is where we get our factory. Again, you can't go and new anything yourself, so you ask the factory these elements. So we get some coordinates, set the point. Sorry, we get the coordinates, set the coordinates, then we get a point. We add the coordinates to the point. We're just building up this tree structure. And again, we'll get a place mark, set its name. And at the very end, once we've created our top level chem element, we call serialize pretty, which will take care of the indentation for us. So if I call create KML, that's what it does. This is an example of using, using parse and serialize, but with, with our uh, KMZ file methods built in. So we can test it and see if what we have is indeed a KMZ file. And if it is, there's the read KML method that will search for the first or the default KML file contained in the archive and return it to you and then we parse it and spit it out. So if we look at a KML file, this is our examples KML file. It's, it's probably two and a half years old by now, but there's a lot of stuff in here. And I can parse that using pretty KML. That just does a clean parse and a clean serialize. Um, if we do, if we do files with unknown elements inside, you can see how those are preserved for you and and spat out again on serialize. What we've done recently in in the KML engine is to bring in the concept of uh, slightly more intelligent parsing that that you can control. So whereas KML DOM will parse everything straight into the structure. If you want to do anything with that, essentially you yourself have to go on and walk that, that tree again, which, which could be fine, maybe not. But to give you the flexibility, uh, we've introduced something called a parser observer. And I'm giving you a sneak peek. It isn't quite checked in yet. And 
we still have to write some proper documentation for it, which we will. But it allows you to get a, a, a kind of a SACS-like interface um, as opposed to DOM SACS. So you get callbacks on, on various things if we can show you that. ParserObserver.h. Okay, this is this is this is how our default parser works. We have callback for a new element and one for add child. And it's easier to show you this by example. This is count KML. What we want to do is we want to just rip through a KML file and count up the usages of the various elements that we see. And you can see that we inherit something from parser observer and we implement this new element. And so as we, as we see new elements come in, we're just going to start putting them into an STL map that we see. And we're, we're going to call print element counts, which is going to iterate through the map and print these out for you. So if I call count KML on KML samples. We can we can see what's just been parsed in the order it's been parsed in. I can pipe this to a numeric sort, and we can see that we had 39 names, 34 visibilities, and so on. So it's it's very flexible what you can do with uh, watching for new elements being created. And likewise, we also give you a method to look for the adding of children onto things, and this is, this is the beginning of a slightly larger program we're going to call check links, and what this is going to do is going to discover everything that could be a URL within a, within a KML file. There's a lot of them. Uh, network links can, can reach out and fetch other files, but there's also things like style URLs and schema URLs and so on, and so if I call this one quickly, Check links, and if I call that on the file that we have, that's what it prints out. It's found all of the style URLs and all of the hrefs. And here you can see how we're doing it. This is our main function. Right here, we bring up a parser. We instantiate print links which is inheriting from our parser observer. We add the observer to the parser, and then we let it rip with the parser method. And that's all there is to it. Okay, there's a bunch more examples. Um, please do go play with them. And this is where we're heading. Um, we, don't, we don't quite consider ourselves production ready just yet. We're still in beta. Everything, Google's always in beta, I know, but we, we really mean it. <laughs> Call this alpha. And you'll know when we're production ready because we'll, we'll call ourselves 1.0. We don't plan to stay in the eternal 0 0.999 cycle. Um, we want to stabilize the API, first of all. That's a very near-term goal because we know what it's like to be chasing a moving target and having to rewrite code every time some guy updates. So we want to get the API stable such that when we change the implementation or add things, you only ever have to you know, add code, not change it. Um, like I said, we don't, do, we, don't, we don't give you a real DOM access where you can you know, walk the DOM and change things in place. We have to address that. And there's essentially all of these core things, these implementation details that I mentioned before. Um, Network link control and update, these are two very interesting things um, that allow communication between server and client. Um, balloon style that I showed at the beginning is, is really just a small part of what you can do with a description balloon. There's a, there's a whole templating mechanism inside KML. You can use extended data and data to uh, template based on other fields. And uh, styling, 
Styling is a little tricky because there are very particular rules about how styling works in KML, um, what overrides what, how things merge. Um, again, it's, it's unfair to expect everyone to, to really understand how this works, so we want to you know, do this for you. And as we, as we head towards this myth 1.0, again, this has to be driven by application. Uh, we want it to be real and be usable. And in, in some sense, what we're trying to do is, is give you a close approximation of, of what's under the hood of Google Earth, like the, the KML parsing part of it. So we can, we can contain a lot of features in memory. And at any given time, you can say, my camera is here. I've parsed all of this stuff. Now tell me what's visible. Now tell me what to draw. There's a lot of things in KML to control that. And it's, it's hard. So, so we want to do it, and we want to do it once. And I think I'm finishing early. I've been talking faster than I expected. So here are some links for you. Um, we have a discussion group. I'll show it quickly. It's linked from the front page. There is a discussion group right there. There's an issue tracker right here. Um, please do file bugs when you find them, or even better, fix them. Send me a patch. <laughs> and if you don't know about Regenerator already, um, that's a Python library that does some of this. Um, but it also gives you a lot of access for generating region-based KML. We're going to be duplicating some of that stuff in libkml. So you're going to get to have beer slightly early. But I'll take questions right now if anybody has any. There's a couple of microphones there and there. Yeah, when do you anticipate 1.0 being ready to be uh, checked in? Say again? Well, when do you anticipate uh, 1.0, the API, being stabilized? Like, uh, We want to stabilize the API much sooner than that. Um, this work here, this, this is going to take a while. And so we're on point two now. Uh, let's say that by 0 0.4, we can make some reasonable promises about having a solid API. Like months from now? Or? Yeah, let's, let's say several months, which is Probably not a very big number. So, <laughs> when you work for Google, you get very nervous about committing to dates. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, just a follow-on question. And when do, would you expect Swig uh, 0.2 to be Swig support to be around? Swig, Swig support is there right now. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we you've can got you've got Java and you've got Python. Um, let's see if I, I can. I don't appear to be online. Oh, I'm lying, I am. Um, if I, I have to, I think I have to do, uh, there's a little demo program we have called, I'm just installing now after building. It's called a DOM viewer and it uses the Python Swig bindings. So if I, There it is. Okay, that's it. If I can get a KML file for us. Frank usually has one. At least one. Oh, there we go. Climate change in our world. So we can just right from the command line, we can bring up DOM viewer. This is going to use the Python swig bindings. And there you can see we've parsed that file into a tree view, and we can see all of the all of the interesting things without any graphics. So it's like the Lynx version of Google Earth. Okay. How about uh, swig bindings for Perl? Are Perl coming back. We had swig bindings for uh, a few more languages in our point one release. We've had to sacrifice a few of them for point two because we're using boost intrusive pointer. And so Swig gave us uh, support for Python and Java. 
Um, we, we hope that SWIG improves a little, and, and when it does, we will implement support for all the other languages that we, that we can. Thank you. Yeah, currently, do you support uh, photo overlay, the photo overlay element? Yes. And is, is photo overlay part of the KML spec? Yes, it is. It is, okay. Thanks. So we, right now, we, the, the point to release supports the entire language. Okay. All Thank of you. it. Parse and, and serialize and generation, yeah. Any more? Uh, I have booth duty immediately following this, so if you have any other questions, come find me at the, uh, the Google booth downstairs. Um, and apart from that, thank you very much. <laughs>